The Equitable Life Assurance Society presents This Is Your FBI. <laughs> This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Presented transcribed as a public service by the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community. Commercials on this Equitable Society program never fail to get a big response from members of this audience. Millions of dollars worth of life insurance have been bought as a result of these messages. You'll see why when you listen to tonight's middle commercial. It will be a straightforward and intelligent talk on the Equitable Education Fund, a practical money-saving plan to make sure that your children get the tremendous advantages of a college education. If that's what you want for your family... You'll welcome this message from the Equitable Society due in about 14 minutes. Tonight's FBI file, The Swing Shift Racketeers. Gambling in the United States goes back as far as the history of the country. And there probably never has been an event involving an element of competition on which there has been no wagering in one form or another. Take the field of politics, for example. In the early days of the Republic, men running on opposing tickets always bet each other a new hat on the outcome of the election. From which custom we have gotten the saying to throw your hat into the ring. That kind of betting is, of course, innocuous at worst. However, the American people, and especially those who work as part of a large group in big offices or factories, have become involved in a situation which is a national problem, organized gambling. In many of those places of employment, the worker wishing to make a bet need go no further than the nearest water cooler. Recently, an investigation was conducted into the gambling situation upsetting production schedules in many industrial plants. That investigation is now finished. Allowing margin for error, the figure still cannot be dismissed. For according to the survey, work done by skilled reporters, the money lost by American workmen to professional gamblers, money lost on betting on horses, the numbers game, baseball and football pool cards, and other things, in the period of the last year amounted to well over a hundred million dollars. Tonight's file opens in a huge factory located on the outskirts of a large Midwestern city. A middle-aged man stands watching raw material being fed into a machine. A second man approaches. Hello, Charlie. Where you been? Got here as quick as I could. Left Nat's office two hours ago. I just need built good for hurrying. Well, let's go where we can talk. What's troubling you? Look, I wish you had my job for just one week. I don't want your job. In fact, I don't want any job. It ain't that I hate work. I just love it so much I like to curl right up and fall asleep beside it. Now, what's gnawing you? The collectors are holding out on us. How do you know? I had a guy around here all morning making bets on one horse. Only half his action was turned into me. You talk to the collectors? No. No, that's your job. Uh, there's one of them now. Where? Guy over there. Take a drink of water. What shift is he on, Charlie? Same as me. Eight to four. He ought to be fixing to quit soon. Yeah. In about ten minutes. And you got no problem, Charlie. When he leaves to go home, I'll be following right behind him. The following morning at the local FBI field office, Special Agent Jim Taylor greets two old friends, police detectives Guy Baker and Tommy Grant. Hello, Guy. 
Hi, Jim. Well, it's good to see you, Tommy. Thanks. Got a chair around here strong enough to hold my partner? Oh, don't start that again, Tommy. This is all muscle. <laughs> you two still working together? <laughs> yeah, we got a great arrangement, too. Tommy handles the physical work, and I do the thinking. Well, here's a bullet he couldn't mastermind, Jim. We'd like it sent to your lab. Uh, sure. Where's it from? A uh, body of a man named Newbury. He was found dead just inside the front door of his apartment over on the east side. That was last night. Guy lives out those little details every once in a while. Yeah. This fellow's full name was Eric Newbury. He was a day laborer at the Adams factory. Yeah. I talked to his wife last night. He also had a little job on the side collecting for a factory bookmaker. I thought Adams cleaned house out at the factory and got rid of that gambling ring. That was last year. But Freddie Jackson was head man of that ring. He's still in jail. Who's running it now? Well, we haven't yeah. found out yet. Of course, we're not sure Newberry's murder is tied in with his being a collector. Uh, Anybody could have done this. Newberry's doorbell rang last night. He answered it. His wife heard a shot. When she got to the door, the killer was gone. Well, my guess would be that there's a connection. Unless Newberry was also mixed up in some labor trouble out of the factory. No, there hasn't been any of that. Mm -hmm. See, Tommy, Jim agrees with me. The murder's hooked up with the racket. Well, you have some word back on that bullet, Jim. Oh, a day or two. Fine. I'll be back. And if I can swing it, I'll come along. Oh, come in, Charlie. You too, Rip. Sorry I'm late, Nat, but Just I... sit down. Let me finish signing these letters. Oh. Now, I'd like an explanation. About what? That killing yesterday. Well, that's what you wanted, wasn't it? Certainly not. Well, why did you send Rip? I on? told you to use him to straighten things out. Looks to me like it's straightened out. Collectors are all paying up today, aren't they, Charlie? Now, listen to me, both of you. We're in business. I grant you it doesn't happen to be a legal business, but it's got to be run like one. Business and killings don't mix, do you understand? Yeah. You, Rip? Well, I don't see no harm in what I did to the guy. If you want me to just dent him from now on, it's okay with me. All right. Now, run along, both of you. I've got work to do. Any report from the lab on that bullet, Jim? No, not yet, Tommy. Guy, is that a shiner you're sporting? Yeah. I can thank my clumsy partner for it. All I did was open my locker door. Sure, while I was bending over to tie my shoe. An old man like him ought to wear slippers anyway, shouldn't he, Jim? Now, don't put me in the middle. Oh, brother, I can't wait to start working alone again. Are you being transferred, Tommy? Nah, I couldn't get that much of a break. I'll tell you what the brain is talking about. We went to see Mr. Adams at the factory. When he heard about the bookmakers being in action again, he hit the ceiling. He wanted to slough the thing right away, but fortunately, my cool head prevailed. Mm -hmm. I convinced him that making a move now would mean we'd never find out if there was a bookmaking angle in the Newbury murder. Well, what'd he say? Giving us a week. To do everything? Yeah, everything. I complained at first, but then, as usual, I got an idea. Uh -huh. What he means is he thought of some extra work I could do. Yeah, our muscular friend here has a job at the Adams factory starting tomorrow morning. Oh, what department? The same one Newbury worked in? Mm-hmm. Didn't I see something in this morning's paper about the Newbury funeral? Yeah, it's being held in about an hour from now. We're going down to cover it. Say, uh, any chance of you hearing from your lab before the day's out, Jim? Well, there's no telling, Guy. I put a rush tag on it. The minute I get any word, I'll call you at headquarters. Where's Nat? Hmm? I gotta see Nat. Where'd he go? Oh, out to lunch. Where? I wouldn't know. We better get back here soon. We got trouble. One of them mean old horse players here to parley. Look, this ain't funny, Rip. There's a new guy at the factory. I think he's a cop. Why? Well, he ain't on the job ten minutes before he's asking where he can get a bet down. He just sounds like a horse player. Nah, not the way he operated. Somebody pointed out my collector. He went to him. Started asking a lot of questions. Like what? Well, if he wins, will he get paid off? Who does he turn the bets into? Stuff like that. Did he get any answers? No. Then what are you worried about? They planted a cop the hate's on. Matt should know about it. Then just sit down and wait till he comes back from lunch. 
Now sit quiet, would you, Charlie? I want to take me a snooze. <laughs> Jim? Guy, I've been waiting for you. I just got a report from the lab on that bullet that killed Newberry. We're in on this thing, too. Oh, it's nice teaming up with you again. What's the FBI angle? The bullet matched a couple in our unidentified ammunition file. Came from the same gun that was used in two murders earlier this year. Where? Both of them down south. Oh, got any details? Yeah, but there aren't very many. One of the murders took place during the holdup of a grocery. A grocer handed over all he had, $9.30, but he was killed anyway. Mm-hmm. Federal marshal in that section working on another case must have accidentally come close to a cave where the bandit was hiding out the following day. He was killed with the same gun. Any description of the killer? Yeah, some. He's tall, has dark hair, and a scar that runs from his left ear to the corner of his mouth. Yeah, I didn't think the Newbury job was done by an amateur. Uh, Tommy working out at the factory? Yeah. Have you heard from him? Yeah. Thinks he's come up with a lead. I'm going to run out there this afternoon. Well, look, I got some work to be done here. It shouldn't take more than an hour. I'll meet you later, and we'll go out to the factory together. <laughs> Me? Yeah. And you want to know who I turned my bets into? That's right. The guy's right outside. Just follow me. Okay. I told him the question you asked. Said he wanted to see you. Good. I want to see him, too. There he is. The guy with the blue shirt. See you later. Hello there. Hi. Well, you've been interested in betting on horses. Maybe I can tell you about it. Maybe you can. Come on, I gotta get something out of the supply room. Okay. What you want to know about? That guy who sent me out here. Does he work for you? Yeah. That's the information you wanted, ain't it? What makes you think that? Well, aren't you a cop? Yeah. I had you pegged this morning. Just what are you doing here? Trying to get information about a man named Newberry. Newberry? Mm Mm-hmm. I don't know. He worked here till he was shot and killed. Oh. On the side, he took bets. Well, I guess a lot of guys do that. I'm sure they do. And I'm also sure they all work for one man. Well, I don't know who that would be, Mac. I only got one guy working for me. You just met him. Now, excuse me, will you? I gotta get some supplies out of here. Don't bother. Why not? You're through work for the day. What do you mean? You're coming with me to headquarters. No, I ain't. <laughs> you took so long leading him here, Charlie, I pretty near fell asleep. <laughs> We will return in just a minute to tonight's exciting case from the official files of the FBI. Now a special message from the Equitable Life Assurance Society to fathers and mothers of young children, to the parents of the little boys and girls who will be reaching college age 10 or 15 years from now. That's when you'll hear that youngster of yours saying, Look, Dad, here's a picture of the college campus. Boy, can't you just see me walking down that path? Your boy and girl would have three good reasons for looking forward to those four years in college. First, college men and women earn more money. Believe it or not, Dad, college grads earn $72,000 more during the years they work than the fellow who has to take a job right after high school. I read it in the paper just the other day. Second, college men land the bigger jobs. What's more, Dad, it said that out of every 16 men earning $10,000 a year and up, 15 are guys with college degrees. Third, the college man gets more out of life. Everything he learns in college can be put into practical use in later life. Art, philosophy, business training, economics, history, all will help him in his progress on the road to success. Keep that in mind, father and mother, and decide now not to leave your family's education to chance. Make sure with an equitable education fund. An equitable education fund? What's that? It's the painless way to pay for your children's college education. In this equitable society plan, you start when your children are young. Then each year, you pay a sum of money that doesn't hurt. 
an amount that scarcely makes a dent in your budget. When your youngster's ready for college, the money's all ready for him. That's spreading the cost of education over 10 or 15 years instead of taking a beating in four. Right. Now, suppose the father dies or becomes totally disabled. Then no more payments are necessary. The fund becomes fully established. When the youngster is ready for college, he gets the same education as if his dad had lived. So don't delay a day longer. Let your equitable society representative show you how little it costs to start an equitable education fund. Or write care of this station to the Equitable Society. That's E-Q-U-I-T-A-B-L-E. The Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States. And now back to the FBI file, The Swing Shift Racketeers. As mentioned earlier in tonight's case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the factory in which this gambling ring operated is no exception to the rule. During World War II, when the laboring group in this country was greatly enlarged, it presented a field so lucrative, professional gamblers moved in and took over. They are still entrenched in some places. In a few cases, they operate with the knowledge of the factory owners, who mistakenly believe the gambling to be a harmless form of relaxation for their men. But this situation is of concern to more than the management of such industrial plants, for it directly affects every person in the nation. Take one factory in one city and assume for the sake of discussion it is geared to turn out a thousand items every day. Each workman, however, spends 10 minutes a day on his gambling activities. So the plant turns out only 950 items. Since the fixed expense of operating the factory remains the same, the manufacturer who could charge a dollar for his product if peak production were maintained, must charge a dollar 10 per item. The extra dime you pay may seem insignificant, but multiply it by the number of items and also by the number of factories throughout the country where that takes place and you realize one thing. While the workmen turn their dollars over to the professional gamblers, the bill for that gambling is paid not by them, but by every one of you. Tonight's file continues in the corridor of a local hospital a few hours later as FBI Special Agent Jim Taylor enters and meets Detective Guy Baker. I just got your message, Guy. Tommy badly hurt? No, Jim. His doctor thinks he'll be okay. All right. What happened? I got slugged and beaten. Come on, we got permission to see him if we don't stay too long. All right. His room's only a couple of doors down. Doctors have any idea how long Tommy be later? Oh, two, three weeks if there are no internal injuries. Mm -hmm. His room. Go ahead, go ahead, Guy. Oh, thanks. Hello, boy. Hi, Tommy. How do you feel, Tommy? <laughs> I'm taped up like a kid's baseball. <laughs> Guy, I sure wish you'd been out there today instead of me. With that fat skull of yours, you'd have just dented the lead pipe and made the pinch. Yeah. There, you see, Jim? See the luck I have? Here I figured I'd finally be able to get myself a new partner. Yeah, I feel real sorry for you. <laughs> Tommy, how much do you remember? Everything, Jim. I tried to make a bet this morning. Somebody pointed out the man who handled our department. What's his name? Uh, Joey Noah. I said I wouldn't give him any action till I was sure of getting paid if I won. Mm -hmm. I said I wanted to know who the head collector was. Well, this afternoon after lunch, he came and told me the head collector was outside. Yeah, go on, Tommy. I contacted him. He was on his way to a supply room. Hmm. I walked along and questioned him. <laughs> it was my mistake. Why would he mean? He led me into the supply room. That's where I got it. He gave it to you? Mm -mm. Another lad got me from behind. I saw his reflection in the window. Oh, see his face? Well, he had a short, thin nose... Long scar on his face. Hmm? I didn't really get enough of a look at him to draw his picture. But here. This is a sketch of what the head collector looks like. Well, that should help. Uh, tell me that scar on the face of the man who slugged you. Does it run from his left ear to the corner of his mouth? Hmm? Well, how'd you know? We're looking for him, too. Well, not much doubt now, Jim, about Newbury's death being tied into that bookmaking ring. No, I guess not. 
Guy, how about you going back to the factory and see what you can dig up out there, huh? Yeah, okay. Meanwhile, I'll go talk to this Joey North and try to get him to identify this picture that Tommy drew. You bums, you stupid, unmitigated bums. Hmm? What's the matter now? Oh, nothing, nothing at all. I'm sitting having a quiet dinner, and I get a call from my man at the factory. Ain't more trouble, is it? Trouble? The place is crawling with cops, and all because of you. Us? You have to slug a guy with a badge. Well, that was Rip's idea. I don't want excuses. I can't run my business on them. I didn't kill the guy, did I? You might just as well have. For 20 years, I worked to get someplace in this town. I don't make enemies. Finally, I get lucky. And who knocks me out of the box? Cops? Oh, no, no. You two. I don't see why we're knocked out of the box. But this thing will blow over in a week. The cops don't forget that quick. Uh, how much money have you got with each collector? Oh, 300. Make the rounds. Collect it all. Okay. Then meet us at my apartment. <laughs> Personnel department, Layton. Special Agent Taylor calling. Is Detective Baker there, please? Just a minute. Special Agent Taylor. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. well, Jim. Guy, I just finished interviewing Joey North, that collector that Tommy told us about. Uh-huh. If we've got any notions about nailing that bookmaking ring, we have to do it fast. They're going under. When? As of right now. Uh, will you ask Mr. Layton to look up the home address of an employee named Charlie Shelby? Mm-hmm. Uh, Layton, would you get me the address of a Charlie Shelby, please? Yeah, he's doing it now, Jim. Shelby, the man with the scar? No, he's the head collector, the one whose picture that Tommy drew. North admitted he's been working with the ring and said Shelby had been by a few minutes before to pick up the payoff money. What's that? Well, the way they operated, each collector kept $300, which he used to pay off the winners and turned in all the losing wages. Uh Uh-huh. This Charlie Shelby told North he was picking up the payoff money from all the other collectors, too. Well, if you could get the names of some of those others, we might hit them off. Uh, But North didn't know any. Uh, I uh, talked to a few of the men around here, and from what it... Oh, hold it, Jim. I think we got the address. Okay. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Charlie Shelby's address is 935 Hudson Street. 935 Hudson. That's near where I'm calling from. I'll go by there now, Guy. I'll meet you at my office in half an hour. Sorry you had to wait this long for me, Guy. Oh, that's all right, Jim. (laughs) Have any luck locating Charlie Shelby? No, that address on Hudson Street was a fake. Turned out to be a laundry. Hmm. The collector you talked to have any idea where Shelby lived? No, none at all. I checked everybody named Shelby in the phone book. Nobody even came close to answering the man in this picture that Tommy drew. Well, we got more than that drawing to go on. Hmm? Came up with an actual photograph of Charlie Shelby. It was in his employment folder. Hey, that's great. Having copies made of it now. Did you get anything else out of the factory? Yeah, an authorization from old man Adams to offer a $1,000 reward for Charlie Shelby's arrest. It might help nail him, all right, but it won't bring in the man with a scar, and he's really the one I want. Nobody I talked to at the factory ever saw anybody answering his description around the place. Joey North did. When? This afternoon, just before Tommy was slugged. North saw him talking to Shelby. Oh, I don't know. What the people at the factory told me, Jim, Charlie Shelby wasn't the type to be head man of the ring. In that case, we've got three people to catch. Did you get any other dope on him? A couple of things. One of them's wrong, and the other one's just no help. What are they? One of the workmen said he saw Charlie Shelby pick up a real wad one day from a collector and say, you have another week like this and that'll give you a bonus. Nat, huh? Yeah. Only trouble is there must be a couple of thousand guys named Nat in this town. Uh, At least. Another workman told me Shelby mentioned that he deposited the take every day after leaving the plant. That couldn't be right, Jim. He didn't get off till four and by then the banks are closed. He worked from eight to four? That's right. Yeah, the banks weren't open when he went to work. and They were closed when he got out. Well, that means the only... Hey, wait a minute. Guy, those two things might be all we need. We've been worrying about you, Nat. Well, start worrying about yourselves. You're both red hot. What? On the way from the vault, I phoned the factory. The cops have been asking questions about both of you. Well, we're grabbing that choo-choo just in time. Rip, if they're looking for you at the factory, it's a cinch the cops have spotters at the railroad station, the airport, the bus terminals, and 
Every place else. Yeah. Yeah, he's right, Rip. But we're leaving anyway. I fixed that. How? We're flying out. But you just said they're watching the airport. Let them. You know that airline flies to the track when the horses run upstate? Uh-huh. A friend of mine owns it. I called him, and there'll be a plane waiting for us. When? Pilot's picking us up on his way to the airport. Anybody mind if old Rip still don't get it? What's so tough to understand? It don't seem to me you answered, Charlie, when you asked about the cops watching for us at the airport. We don't leave from the municipal airport, Rip. These planes fly out of a little field just outside the city limits. Matt, you figured out yet how... Oh, that's the pilot. Come on. It'd be a waste just leaving this piece of gin. Well, grab it and let's get going. Well, we weren't sure all three of you'd be here. Uh, what do you mean? You're all under arrest. Rip Conway was tried in federal court on a charge of murder... After being convicted, he was sentenced to life imprisonment in a federal penitentiary. Nat Harrison and Charlie Shelby were convicted in state court for the murder of Eric Newberry and sentenced to terms of life imprisonment in state prison. The other members of Nat Harrison's gang were convicted of violating the attic gambling statutes and each received an appropriate sentence. During his conversation with Detective Baker, Special Agent Taylor remembered there was one place in the city where safe deposit boxes were open 24 hours a day. A quick trip to that institution and an inspection of the record showed the only customer whose first name was Nat to be a Nat Harrison. By getting to his apartment when they did, they were able to accomplish results you have just witnessed. You also witnessed something else during the course of this evening's case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, the injuries to Detective Tommy Gretz. While they fortunately proved not to be too serious, it is obvious they might well have been fatal, for they were inflicted by a criminal to whom the taking of a life was part of the day's work. It was also part of the day's work to Detective Grant that he sustained those injuries, since every time a law enforcement officer starts the investigation of a crime, he literally takes his life in his hands. To him, death is an occupational hazard, whether he be a member of a local police force, a county or state official, or a special agent of your FBI. In the past year, almost a hundred of those officers have been killed in line of duty, have been killed in defense of you, the American people. Now one last word to fathers and mothers. Of all the things you can do for your children, there's no greater proof of your love for them than an equitable education fund. They'll be grateful for it as long as they live. Your boy or girl may only say a few words like, Thanks, Mom. Thank you, Dad. But you know from the look in his eye and the ring in his voice that he'll never forget your foresight in starting an equitable education fund. Right now, make that wise resolution to see your equitable representative soon. <laughs> Next week, we will dramatize another case from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, a colorful recounting of a human manhunt. Its subject, larceny. Its title, The Flophouse Frame-Up. The incidents used in tonight's Equitable Life Assurance Society's broadcast are adapted from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. However, all names used are fictitious. And any similarity thereof to the names of persons living or dead is accidental. Tonight, the music was composed and conducted by Frederick Steiner. The author was Jerry D. Lewis. Your narrator was William Woodson, and Special Agent Taylor was played by Stacey Harris. Others in the cast were Bill Conrad, Sam Edwards, Paul Fries, Jonathan Hole, Tony Hughes, and Edmund McDonald. This is your FBI, a Jerry Devine production, was directed by Sid Goodwin. This is Larry Keating speaking for the Equitable Life Assurance Society of the United States and the Equitable Society's representative in your community and inviting you to tune in again next week at the same time when the Equitable Life Assurance Society will bring you another thrilling transcribed story from the files of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Flophouse Frame-Up on This is Your FBI. <laughs>